Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. So welcome back to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at um, something around contracts, which I know we've looked at before, but this one is advantages and disadvantages of contracting in the therapy process. Right. So contracting, one of my favourite subjects and central tenant in transaction analysis psychotherapy, and I'm sure others but uh, as well, but I was born and bred when I started to train in TA therapy in the whole world of contracting. So contracting is something which I've always done in the last 40 years. Yeah. And I'm sure you've had. I'm yes. sure you've trained yeah. in contractual theory as well. Yeah. Um, so I thought it'd be useful. And uh, I think the other two podcasts are much more general about contracting. So let's start and talk about contracting. Right. There's different types of contracts. There's business contracts, sometimes called admin contracts. Yeah. Uh, or even business. Yeah. Business or admin usually called. Um, and then. Um, we have treatment contracts. Yeah. Is concerned with the actual uh, goal of therapy or what we want from therapy. So anybody who goes to see specifically in the TA world, but I suspect other disciplines, will have the sort of work business admin contracts. And then they need to talk about treatment contracts, in my view. Um, and I want to talk about the advantages and positives of that because I know some disciplines who don't use contracts. And um, certainly aren't so specific about them. Uh, whereas TA is pretty sort of like contractual theory is really a major tenant in TA. Yeah. Um, so if we look at the, let's get the admin contracts, business contracts, work contracts out of the way, which any of those categories, names we can use. And then you, I'll go through what would be in my admin contract, and I'm sure there may or may not be um, so in yours. So number one, and there's no linear order. It's a bit like um, TV talent shows when they give the result out. They say no <laughs> linear order. In no particular order, yeah. No particular order, XXXX. So this is in no particular order. So number one, uh, costs, fees. Yep how much it's yep. going to cost if it's normal therapy as opposed to say low cost therapy so at the Manchester Institute there's 30 odd therapists who are qualified and they may start off from about 50 pounds for the hour and then we have low cost therapy uh, which is uh, uh, you know low income a lot of students tend to use that um, route and that will be 15 pounds fee for 50 minutes and there's up to 26 sessions. Whereas if you have, um, you know, away from the low cost route, it isn't limited to 26 sessions, for example. It's much more yeah. well, gross, easy now. Hang on. Oh, <laughs> yes. gosh, sorry about that. Bless just, you. Just the thought of fees and... <laughs> You've had an allergic reaction. And things like <laughs> that. I think, I think I've just come from having a massage and I, I think I've relaxed so much. That I've sneezed. Anyway, so 50 minutes, 15 pounds. So it's quite, I think it's a good deal that. Absolutely. Uh, so fee structure first. Um, that, well, I'll say not in linear order, but anyway, uh, like how often you have to pay that. It's usually weekly. Um, sometimes people pay monthly. I mean, psychoanalytical world, you pay yearly, by the way. Um, and then things like, um, you know, it's holidays. Do people have to pay for holidays? You know, the admin structure. Yeah, yeah. It needs to be spelled out, I think, in any contracts, really. So you know what services you've got. Yes. Uh, so I think that's important. Um, how often you come? So nowadays, different from when I started therapy 40 years ago, there's much more um, people asking for fortnightly therapy because of the actual financial cost in today's society. 
So they may pay fortnightly. Uh, I'm sorry, they might come fortnightly. I I like weekly therapy, so um, that would be in my admin cost. And then there's things like, you know, what do we do when we are ill or uh, things like that? So different therapists have different rules, like 24 hours therapy or, sorry, therapist notice yeah. or seven hours therapy notice. Things like uh, those sorts of things, particularly. Um, any to, any more to add that I might have left out in the admin? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> I think for me, it, it's about not um, ending therapy abruptly. There's something in there about you know coming to a an agreement, a, a, an ending or whatever. Yeah, um, and just that if they don't arrive on time, you know, th th that's kind of them losing part of that hour. Um, yeah, and that I don't offer emergency out of hours services kind of thing do you know what I mean that and then there's you know what they should do contact the GP or go to A&E or whatever that I've just got that on as a standard mm. and and then to, it's face to face in my case yeah yeah whereas yours I don't know if yours is online or it's face online and face to face whichever yeah yeah, yeah. you have that put into the contract as well so yeah. those sort of admin business contracts need to be stated I think because you are paying for a service, and I do think this should be an agreement. Absolutely, it should be bilateral. Yeah, yeah, both of you. And some therapists ask you to sign these business contracts. By the way, um, I never went that far. I, I was okay with the verbal agreement. Yeah, and also another contract which might come up at the beginning of therapy is some rules of therapy, like you know confidentiality. Yeah, I've uh, got that in mind as well. Not turning up yeah. under the influence of drink or drugs. Yeah, yeah. So some specific ones, according to different, you know, therapists might be, yeah, there as well. That's all yeah. I've done under the business of um, psychotherapy. Now, I think they're very important contracts because these business contracts, because they spell out terms of service and they, they you know, also outline the boundaries of the service that's offered yeah i know i know we've probably touched on this in the previous podcast but i also have um like a form gathering information that's attached to it that my clients get either sent out or you know they get it in the session with oh. the emergency contact details and you know have they previously had therapy why are they coming to therapy what are they hoping to get out of therapy GP address, their address, just basic information about themselves. Are they on any medication? That sort of stuff. Yeah. So for business contracts, I don't have any disadvantages. For no, me, me neither. A positive in terms of providing a safe structure. Yeah. Transparent for structure. both the client and the therapist. I think it's yeah. that safe. Yeah. 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 Uh, almost like a legal framework. Yes. You're going to buy services then there needs to be an agreement yeah. bilaterally. I think some people that I've come across over the years have been quite sketchy with information. Mm. You know, they mm. won't give the full address or they'll say they don't actually know what the doctor's address is or whatever. And I get a bit curious about that. Yeah, and then it's up to you whether you want to take that client on. Yeah. Would I take a client down if they didn't give the doc's address? Interesting question. Things like that. But uh, individual therapists will have their own style here. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah, you are right. Um, OK, so we now move on to the treatment contract. What somebody actually wants psychologically and what they want to change and how they've come, they've come to therapy in the first place and I think that it's really important to have an outcome focused agreement yes uh, yeah. because again you're buying into a service absolutely yeah yeah you get a lot of money for it and I think that contract or agreement should be explored and spelt out at the beginning of the therapy process yeah at the beginning yeah yeah I think it's a good opening session to have with the client to talk about that mm. and for lots of reasons um 
one because it, it, I, I think it provides safety structure and boundaries but it also gives a guiding light or framework of where both of you are heading yeah and ta therapists particularly but other therapists um also talk about the difference between soft and hard contracts so a soft contract would be something which is more vague like say for an ex exploring contract okay we'll just explore the themes yeah. of depression or we'll explore the etiology of your anxiety or we'll explore how come uh you know you have had eating disorders for the however long you've had it or we'll explore how you become the way you are and there's nothing wrong I think with exploring contracts and for many therapists they will accept exploring contracts I think I'll put a proviso on it though and that is what do you do when you finish exploring so you can have yeah. exploring contract and then what and I think what needs to happen is once you've explored what you are exploring then you make a contract another contract or you review yeah because you explore depression for a long time and explore explore anxiety or generalized anxiety or whatever we're talking about and then what <laughs> you know, it's like what happens then so I think the name needs to be a contract and hopefully out of the exploring will will come where you're heading yeah I think that's what I always do I think I always start off with an exploratory contract because it, yes, that's yes. the part of getting to know the client and and everything, building the relationship. Yeah. Uh, the important bit, though, I think, Jackie, I agree. By the way, a uh, lot of therapists do that. Is like, how do long do you explore for? Yeah. Because that can be a defense process put up by the client to keep yeah. you away from actual instant, you know, going towards change. Um. And that you make a change contract after the exploring. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, people listening to this podcast might think that's a bit... Um, well, obviously I do that. But lots of therapists don't do that. And also they can keep exploring for a very long time. Absolutely. Yeah. And going round and round in circles and not really getting anywhere. <laughs> yeah. But that's either the manipulation by the... Uh, Client, I'm using manipulation in an unaware place, not actually yes. manipulation from a con conscious place. Or the therapist gets caught up in the process as well. Yeah. So they both go around and around. Number one, that then becomes very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Number two, no change happens, which might be the aim of the game by the client or unawarely, of course, the therapist. And uh, number three, it reaffirms the script of the client. Do you think that's sometimes a criticism of psychotherapists that that's what they do is just do an exploratory contract and don't actually come to a resolution at the end of it that they just go for years in an exploratory fashion yeah and it's often yes i do think that and often uh, that's said in many different ways you've said yeah. it in a distinct way there um but it's the therapist that has an open it doesn't happen I explain to you has an open ended contract yeah whereas they can just explore and explore and explore and the the client then puts up their defense systems and they explore and explore and explore and then they can get caught up in repetitive behaviors or games both parties yeah and nothing much 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 <laughs> might not happen except for it might move into past timing yes or move yeah. into um confirming the client's script or it might move into confirming the therapist script or it might move into as i say a sort of unstructured vague nebulous time time process uh, and i think that is often thrown at, or might be thrown at therapists that we're not actually doing anything yeah seem to be um past timing or explore things or uh, you know where's the results and all these sorts of things which can be thrown in the therapist. And I think it's very important to move some time. And I think it's up to the timing of the therapist and the client when this happens, by the way, from an exploring contract to a much more specific one. 
Yeah, because the title of this is Advantages and Disadvantages of Having a Contract. So one of the advantages would be having clarity and commitment from both parties. Yes, and also, yes, and also an outcome. Yes, yeah, yeah. That both parties have agreed on the outcome. Yes. Which could be, instead of being depressed, that I want to be relaxed. Yeah. You know, instead of feeling unhappy in my life, I want to have more contentment. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a actual structured outcome. And that outcome, depending what type of therapist you are, you might want to go further and say, how will I know when you've got that outcome? I was just about to say that. Yeah. yeah. When will we when, know that you've got there with content? Yeah. What does that look like? How will it be for you? Yeah. 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 So that has to be put into it. So you've got a yeah. specific behavioral, observable, outcome focused agreement. Yeah. Because a lot oh. of the time on my contract where there is a section, what do you want from therapy? People will put to be happier. <laughs> Yeah, well, you have to split that down. Yeah. <laughs> then you have to ask, I think, an important question to you and the client, is it achievable? Yes, absolutely, yeah. So that's one big advantage, providing, I think, uh, a structure, a sequence, and a direction in therapy, which is bilaterally agreed by both people, and both people will know when you've got there. Yeah, and having that, there will be structure and boundaries around that, whether it is a, you know, a, a I don't know how you say it, a time restraint contract yeah. that you're yeah. going to work together for X amount of weeks or whatever it is. Yeah. 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 A second advantage is, is that provides transparency between the two people. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's not sort of like hidden away or not said, or, you know, we've got an explicit agreement going on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and like you so, said, that maybe that you review it or you go back to it. Well, it's well, not just like made and then put in a drawer and forgotten about. Well, thirdly, it provides psychological security and safety, I think. Yeah. Fourthly, while you're making the contract, it builds up a relationship forming process between therapist and client. So there's a more robust, robust bond. Because yeah. it takes quite a a while, one session, two sessions, whatever, to get to this contract. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So you might spend four sessions making the treatment contract. You might, yeah. well, you'll make the business contract pretty quickly in sort of about 20 minutes, but yeah, talking about um, a treatment contract, I think people listening to this are going to put a time in it. I think you need to give yourself at least four sessions to make it. Now, if you make it in one session, fine. But you see, I think there's more to this. You need to also ask, how might you stop yourself? You might, to the client, I mean, how might they sabotage themselves or stop themselves from achieving the, um... achieving the contract? That's a discussion which might have in the process of making the contract. Yeah. Yeah, so you there's lots of layers to it. I think one, one of the things that I was thinking about was empowerment as well that the client being involved in the process of the contract it's not like in the good old days where you know the I don't know the psychoanalyst would say this is what's wrong with you and this is what I'm going to do they're actually involved in the process of the contract and the treatment planning absolutely but nowadays there's a word for this co-created relationship yeah the two of you have a, bi a bilateral co-created relationship and that's very different, like you have just said, from 100 years ago, where it was much more of a one-up, one-down analyst position. Yeah. And they know that having that empowerment and that involvement in it, there's no surprises to them either. So hopefully, do you know what I mean? That gives them that safety, security, and that, you know, that safe space and everything. Yeah. So I think that's a really important advantage, by the way, that the client will feel empowered or at least the potential for empowerment yeah in taking charge of the process in um working out an agreement or goal and to and also talking about how they could stop that or sabotage that will yeah. i agree with you potentially a very empowering situation for the client yeah and you touched then on goals as well you know that 
there may be are some specific things within the contract that the client wants to achieve. It might be that they've come for a specific reason. Mm. Mm. I I don't know that they they want to go abroad on holiday this time next year, and that's their end goal. That's what they want to achieve, but they're anxious and frightened of flying, whatever. Yeah. I agree more. And I think it's really important that you give yourself some sessions to explore these sabotage mechanisms yeah um and also what they need to do to deal with their sabotage mechanisms and how will it look like when you've achieved the outcome of the contract yeah so you won't do this in one session or if you do you're zooming through too far you know far too quickly for my liking it should be giving yourself four or five sessions to do the contracting and building a rapport up in a co-created process with the client as you go along. Yeah. And I'm sure you do contracting in this way, don't you? Yes. Yeah, definitely. I I was thinking as you were talking then, I think it's part of the exploratory contract that I use to draw up the other contract, if that makes sense. I'm getting to know the client while we're doing the contract over, you know, a few weeks yeah i'm not sure i'd take four or five weeks but definitely a couple of weeks yeah okay a fifth advantage and a tip for people listening uh one is that the agreement is chosen between the two people so both of them know what they're doing yes a tip in this though if the contracting goes a bit haywire or quite often and i i, I this has happened a lot when supervision when i talk to the therapist um, and it's unbelievable in one ways, but um, the therapist has thought they made a contract about X. However, the client has thought that they made a contract about Y. In other words, they both have different contracts. Yeah. That's because it's not been explicitly enough. It's not been specific enough. They but is that ch- one of the disadvantages that it's kind of misaligned? It can be. And it can yeah. be a disadvantage uh, of a contract. A, yeah. yeah. You could put that in the disadvantage column, I suppose, that if the therapist doesn't check out in the explicitness of the contract, yeah. in fact, why some therapists write it down, um, the therapist can think they've got one particular contract, but actually the client thinks they've got another one. And it and, and the, the danger of that, of course, is people go two ways and not go in the same direction and i yeah. suppose you can put that in the disadvantage column yeah yeah and that the, again the client can feel like they've been misunderstood or misheard or whatever it is yeah yeah so just while we're on disadvantages might might as well go over there then one mm. huge disadvantage and i'll tell you some therapists that really don't like contracts gestalt therapists they don't deal with contracts um, and one of the major disadvantages they would say, and other, other people who perhaps don't deal with contracts either as a therapeutic process, is that um, the clients might often adapt to what the um, therapist is suggesting. Yeah. And therefore, um, they adapt to please the therapist. And you end up in a, with an adapted contract rather yes. than transaction analysis terms, an adult to adult contract. Yeah. And I suppose in the early days, if it's the first time you've met that person, if you were to do the contract in the first session or in the first couple of weeks, you wouldn't really know whether that was adaptive or not because mm. you haven't built up that relationship. Yeah, and they're very well defended often. Yeah, the second yeah. one would be um, that by having goals, agreements, contracts, you might be predetermining the journey of the ther- the, the actual therapy road rather than letting things emerge in a very organic way. Yeah, because I, th- I think, I don't know whether it's a disadvantage or a misunderstanding around contracts sometimes is that once it's made and you've signed it in blood and sweat and tears, it can't be changed. <laughs> Whereas it, it can, it can be, do you know what I mean? Reviewed and assessed and adapted dependent on what how the therapy is going and what the client wants. They might decide that actually this isn't what I want to be looking at. Mm. yes but that's very true um i think it's important to have reviews and all those things because some people i i I do think that they think it's quite rigid if you have a a, you know a contract around treatment 
mm, mm. rather than, well, what happens if I turn up one day and I don't want to talk about that and, you know, something's happened and I want to talk about this? And it's like, well, that's OK. We can talk about that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's So that's a, that's another disadvantage. And also when I said emerge, I mean that. So the psychodynamic psychotherapists, perhaps, for example, don't, I think, work with these sort of contractual processes. They would argue, and especially gestalt therapists as well, that it's really important to allow um, underlying unconscious processes to emerge rather than have a predetermined contract. Yeah. And if you have contracts and goals and all that sort of stuff, then you'll miss out what might emerge. And you also, what might happen is that the client might go underground. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or And also another disadvantage is if you've got a predetermined specific contract, you may miss out on a lot of other things. Absolutely. So some people would, some therapists would say, well, I just like to go with what emerges in a therapeutic session and then we'll really go with that unconscious process rather than have a, a specific behavioral observable achievable road yeah i think is, it... is, there, is there a happy medium between the two bob <laughs> what well, say a little bit more about that what well, you, just what that you... there's an overarching contract with an overarching aim or a direction let's say that is is not rigid you know i think some clients i don't know they don't like the formal contract or the formal nature of a contract it can feel quite restrictive to them mm. 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 well are you talking about the difference between again it comes from the ta world these terms general overall art reaching contracts and sessional contracts yeah maybe maybe yeah you know so we'll go with what emerges every session, but we have a general direction. Yeah. Yeah. I think when, you know, I've had clients that have said to me, you know, when you first sent me the, you know, the form to fill out and, and all this sort of stuff, I thought it was very formal. But then mm -hmm. once we discussed it, the reason why I do that, you know, it's for your safety as well as mine and that, you know, we have the business side of things covered. They mm -hmm. kind of understood it, but yeah if if that was to be explored in a session mm. under a you know a, a treatment contract mm. they might not like the formal setting of it mm. that all makes sense to me so maybe there is a middle ground um i was talking to one of uh, a therapist friend of mine who runs long psychotherapy uh, intensives and teaches off them and he said, oh, when I'm with TA therapists, after the therapy, when they're asking questions, they often say, well, where was the contract? He didn't make a contract. Because they're taught always, TA therapists, to make contracts, you know, you know which are behavioural and observable. And his answer was, well, I just wanted to see what emerged. Yeah. And we'll go from there. And do you think that's okay? Uh, well, I think it's okay. Yes, of course. It depends on the style and yeah. what you believe in psychotherapeutic process and principles. Um, uh, I, I think out of what may emerge, you may make an agreement. Yeah, I think that's what I like. Do you know what I mean? That, yeah, there is room for something to emerge and the co-creation and the conversation and everything. But that overarching it, there is some sort of direction there. Yeah. Definitely. And um, see, if you went to see a psychoanalyst, because they still exist, by the way. Yeah. I didn't say to you, might be a different form, but their methods might be very similar in terms of interpretation. Yeah. Two, three, four interpretations a session. Um, free association. Just yeah. let him person talk and deal with what emerges and then interpret it. Um, and the ideas of transference and everything else. Um, they would probably see contracts as an anatomy because 
it takes away for you or it may take away for your association so i don't think it's about right and wrongs i think it's about different styles i personally like a halfway house yeah i think i do too yeah but and it's was... understanding as well that some people will like a, a structure to it and other people won't and it's being adaptable as well mm. TA today, which is probably the best, well, best, well, people might argue, but it's, I think it's probably the well-known, the most well-known introductory book to TA, on the, written by Ian Stewart and Van Joins, came out in 1989, there's different editions. They have at least two chapters on contracts. but And they're very, well, the way we are talking here, you make a contract observable, specific, achievable, look for sabotages what do they need to achieve the contract it's like a sort of uh one two three four of psychotherapy yeah and for me very useful especially for beginning therapists actually i think yeah i think probably. i needed the contract probably more than the client <laughs> in the early days <laughs> maybe, yeah maybe because it provides a structure for therapy yeah. um i think quite often therapists will get more experienced I've done many, many clinical hours. Probably then start to feel safe with, well, let's just see what emerges and then we can go from there. Yeah. So there's disadvantages and advantages of contracts. Probably I do like a halfway house, I think. I do like to think, I do like, well, I do have a, I suppose there's an agreement. Let's see what just emerges over to you. And then out of that, we may bilaterally agree on the direction we're going yeah and i think that's the important bit is to have that conversation with the client so that they know what it is that we're doing whether it's a sessional contract or or whatever it is yeah i think it's really important to look out for adapt what i would call adapted contracts sir. yes you know because you know if they're just adapting from their unconscious part of themselves on ta child ego state and somehow the therapist is taken that direction then they could just reinforce their script so i think it's really important for therapists to think about that the contracts come from in ta was adult to adult the age they are rather than a younger self yeah thank you very much bob yeah i like to i've always liked talking about contracts yeah me too i mean i it was what I was first trained in. Yeah. And it's good to look at it from both points of view, the advantages and the disadvantages. And yeah. I, I'm happy that there is a halfway house. <laughs> I feel comfortable yeah. in that place, yeah. Okay, thank okay, you. Okay, so what we're going to be doing next time, I'm really looking forward to this one, is shadow and light within the therapy process. So am I. Roll on next week. Until next time, Bob. See you next week. Bye. Bye, -bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors Podcast We hope you enjoyed the show Don't forget to subscribe And leave us a review We'll be back next week With another episode